Let's all stand together now and sing, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on. No pain nor death can enter there, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling It's glittering towers, the sun outshines, I feel like traveling on. That heavenly mansion shall be mine, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly On the last, the Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling on until that blessed home I see. I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling. Right and fair, I feel like traveling on. Once again, yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is right and fair. I feel like traveling on. All right, we're going to teach you folks how to clap, some of you younger folks, all right? Y'all play a verse, and here we go. You ready? You're doing good. That's for all the independent Baptists that don't like clapping. We dedicate that to you. Here we go now. Yes, I feel like traveling on. On. My heavenly home is bright. Feel like traveling on. Well, are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Say amen. God is good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Larry, come on down here, brother, the book man. And he's got some tables out front. Go by and get some of those good books. We love him. Thank the Lord. Johnny Pope won him to Christ through a telephone conversation. And you never know who you meet, the impact you're going to have. And we love you, Brother Larry, and I, I won't make you climb me steps. It takes a real man to go up and down them things right there three or four times. But we love you, buddy. Thank you for being here. He lives in Indiana, but uh, we he's a Yankee, but we still yeah. love him. But, Brother, won't you pray for us tonight? We love you, man. Thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. We thank you for this great church and this great pastor. A church and a pastor is concerned about people dying and going to hell, and they do every second, minute, week, and day. I pray that you be with us tonight. If anybody who's not saved, dear Jesus, help them to get saved before they walk out of this building. And thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Praise your, praise your wonderful name. Now we ask these things. God directs us in all that we do. Amen. Amen. All right, remain standing. If well, I tell you what you do, be seated, and we'll sing and be seated. But when we get down to the course, you got to stand back up. I love this song we're going to do right here, and uh, and I just want to say this about our church. I love you people so very much, and I appreciate we we had this morning some first time visitors. Never been in this church one day in their life. Just moved here from out of state.
pastors trying to find a place to go to church, a mom and a daughter, but they walked in a place where they'd never been one day in their life in a community they've just moved to, and they felt comfortable enough that they could go to the altar and have somebody pray for them. That spoke volumes to my heart. The church is open to anybody and everybody. One fellow said, Brother Joe Arthur, he allows most anybody to come. I said, you got that right. It's not just most anybody. We let anybody come, and we want them to come because we got something to tell them. But that speaks volumes to you folks, making people feel at home, making them feel welcome, and we thank you for that. I love this song, Let's Do It. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. We're going to let you sit down on this one. Jerry's going to sing the first verse. Get down to that course and you help him out. God sent. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Sing with me. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he all fear is gone Because I know, I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives And then one day I'll cross that river I'll fight life's fight no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns let's all stand sing his chorus because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just. Because you're doing so good, let's sing it one more time. Oh. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds. We'll go ahead, men, let's go ahead and receive our tithes and offering this evening. You go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much. We'll have a video here. We're going to have a video during our time of offertory about our VBS. And we have been so excited. Now, how many of you were able to come and be a part of VBS the other week? Praise God. Thank you so much for coming. All you workers did such a wonderful job. But we're going to do a great job. Thank you. Give them a hand. They do great. Somebody, hey, Barry, somebody on our social media said you look like King Tuck in your outfit. I said, but we got an end. It was wonderful. I'm telling you, I laughed, I laughed, I laughed. And Gary, I laughed at you. I'm going to be honest with you, son. That was plumb funny. He did great. 
I'm telling you, Saturday Night Live ain't had nothing on us. I'm telling you. It was awesome, and I just appreciate everybody just having a boatload of fun. And, man, we want young people to come and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. But will you help me one more time to give our Bible school workers a great hand? And uh, then after he prays, we're going to watch a little short video. You guys back there ready? And uh, is that smoke coming out of there? Are you smoking back there, son? All right. All right. No smoking in the sound room. Amen. All right. Pray for us, brother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here once again, Lord, to be able to give. Lord, I pray you'd take this, Lord, what we give, and I pray you'd use it, further it for your kingdom. God, I pray that you, you would just touch it in a great and mighty way, God, because you can do more with the little bit that we have than anything else in the world. And we thank you so much, God, that you've given us opportunity to have this time, Lord. I pray you'd bless the giver, God, Lord. I pray you'd touch it, God. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lisa, will you stand up, please? I appreciate Lisa. She was willing to play the part, and nobody liked her. 
I'm telling you. When you and her got into it in that one scene, I said, if their home survives this Bible school, we may not want to do this again. <laughs> but it was just wonderful, 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 wonderful. Okay, got some good music lined up tonight. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I guess they want a better introduction than that. <laughs> Here is Tony Orlando and Dawn. Amen. the 
job, son. I love those great songs that magnify our Lord. Uh, Brother Caleb Martin, his dad pastored Ben Ford Baptist Church for over 40 years, and about 10 years ago, his, do his dad, Dr. Lynn Martin, whom I preached for many times, uh, retired, and Caleb stepped right in where his dad left off. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years. And listen, you think, how many has ever been in the middle of nowhere? You've been to the middle of nowhere. You've never been to Ben's Ford Baptist Church in Bogalusa, Louisiana. You, you, you don't go there by accident. Uh, you go there because you're, on, you're going there on purpose. I asked your dad one time, I said, what's on this road? He said, our church. I said, but I mean, what else is on this road? He said, our church. But I mean, what else is on this road? He said, Joe, our church is on this road. And he's doing a wonderful job, and they're enlarging their sanctuary. And I love this young man, and God is starting to raise him up and bless him and send him out. And I am thrilled beyond measure. And so he's going to come preach a little bit. And I told him, I said, now, Caleb, I only preach about 10 minutes on Sunday night. And so he's, he's in a hurry. But it thrills me that there are young people singing, preaching, and living for Jesus Christ. And I will not use my last few moments of life that I have left to discourage the next generation, but encourage them and make an investment. And I want you to make welcome tonight my friend, Brother Caleb Martin. You come on, son, take your text. Man. Is that King James? Yes, sir, hey, all the way. Good. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. I enjoyed that singing. Tell everybody I was I was cut out to sing. They just sewed me back up wrong. Amen. It is good to be here. Praise the Lord for this church. And uh, I love being here at Harvest Baptist Tabernacle. Thank you, Brother Joseph. And uh, Thursday night I was in Rockwell with Brother Cody, and I told them it was good to be there. And I'm telling you it's good to be here for us preachers. It's good to be anywhere. I had a preacher friend of mine that was uh, starting a prison ministry and his first time to go to the prison, he got in there and he forgot where he was at. He didn't realize he was not in church. So he said, men, I'm glad to be here. And he looked at them prisoners and he said, and I'm glad to see you here. And then he said, and I'm sure your presence here has made the world a better place. Amen. I love you, Pastor, Dr. Arthur. Love his family, Miss Julie. They have been precious to me. Uh, I, he is my favorite preacher. He came to Ben's Ford Baptist Church when I was 14 or 15 years old. And uh, he started investing in my life then. I'm 38 years old now. He's still investing in my life. I love him. If you talk about Brother Joe, I'll argue with you. If you talk about Miss Julie, I'm going to fight you. Amen. So uh, Brother Joe has been a mentor to me, and to prove that, uh, I wrote down seven mother-in-law jokes. But I'm not man enough to read them, amen? Give me at least one. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles tonight, the book of Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Well, glory, glory, glory. Amen. Romans chapter 8, when you get there, let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. Verse number 5 says this in Romans 8, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, that is worldly minded, that is sinfully minded, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is what? 
life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the written word of God. We thank you that we can open your Bible and God just glean information to help our life. And Lord, I pray tonight that this message would be an encouragement and a help to every single person that is here. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Be with my family, my wife, and my children as I'm away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This evening I want to speak on a battle we are all fighting in. Every one of us find ourselves standing on this battlefield. I have read books and I've even watched uh, documentaries of some famous battles. I've read books about the Battle of Gettysburg and I've read books about the Battle of Yorktown and, and I've read books and watched documentaries of the Battle of Normandy when our men stormed those beaches. I, I've even read some about the Battle of Waterloo but the battle we, we speak of tonight is more fierce, it's more fiery and, and it's seen more fallen than any other battle known to man. And our text tells us this. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Tonight I want to speak on the battle of your minds. The battle of your minds. I've been in church. I tell people I've been in church since I was in the womb. My dad has been preaching the gospel for 50 years. As Brother Joe said, he pastored the great Ben's Ford Baptist Church before I was even born, and he spent 40 years of his life there. He started a Christian school in 1982, and I wasn't born till 1985, so I grew up in a Christian school. Every week of my life, I've heard sermons. I, I would suggest to you that I've probably heard more sermons than about anybody on this planet. All of the messages I've heard, I've heard a lot of great messages about the heart. I've heard a lot of great messages about the soul and we should preach about the heart and we should preach about the soul. But I haven't heard many about the mind. And Jesus said in the book of Matthew, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. I've heard it said like this you become what you think about if that statement is true we should guard our thoughts I've heard others say it like this you bring about what you think about if that statement is factual we better guard our thoughts how does a millionaire become a millionaire I've read behind some men who became billionaires and all these men who are now billionaires have one thing in common. They may work in different fields. Some was in the oil field. Some was in the food industry. Some was in the gas field. So some was in the financial markets. But, but, but how did, how, what's the one thing they all have in common? If you read behind them, they all think of money. You bring about what you think about. How does a pervert become a pervert? He puts perversions in his mind. He puts evilness and evil images in his thoughts and that's how he becomes a pervert. Remember as he says this, the statement is, you bring about what you think about. Solomon said it like this in Proverbs chapter number 23 and verse 7. He says, whatsoever man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Last year when I was here, I told you a story, a true story about my little son Deacon. He's now eight years old, and man, I love him to death. I miss him. I've been gone from him for a week now, and I'm ready to get home and see my little boy Deacon. And last year I told you this story, and I'm going to tell it again because it fits this message as well. Several years ago, I was preaching a week-long revival down in Pensacola, Florida. 
Monday night was good. We had a couple of people get saved. Tuesday night was good. Had a great altar call. Man, I was just celebrating, just excited about what the Lord was doing. Wednesday night, I get out of church and I got a call from my lovely wife, Miss Tony. And she said, Caleb, you need to talk to your son. My son. When he's being good, he's our son or her son. But when he's being bad, it's my son. <laughs> and I said, baby, what's wrong? She said, let him tell you. I got on the phone and Deacon was crying. I could barely understand him. He was going, daddy, daddy, daddy. I said, son, slow down. What happened? What happened? He said, mama almost killed me, daddy. She almost killed me. I said, what did you do? What did you do? He said, Daddy, do you remember before you left? And you told me, you said, you said, Deacon, can you be the man of the house? You told me, you said, De you said, you said, Deacon, I, I'm about to leave and you got to take care of your mom and your sister. Can you be the man of the house, Deacon? Can you be the man of the house? I said, yes, son, I remember that. He said, Mama didn't hear that, Daddy. I said, what did you do? He said, Mama cooked supper and I didn't like it. And so I said, woman, get in there and make me a bacon sandwich. <laughs> Whew. I said, son, you've been hanging around your papa too long. He said, but daddy, I thought you said I was in charge. I thought you said I was in charge. I said, son, you thought wrong. You see, your thoughts can get you in trouble. Eve's first temptation in the garden was with her thoughts. Satan came to her and said, Why are you not eating of the tree of knowledge and good and evil? She said, Because the Lord told us not to eat, because when we do, we shall surely die. And, he, and, and then the devil says, You shall not surely die. For the Lord knows that if you eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you will be like him. And Eve began to ponder what the devil told her. She began to think about what the devil told her. And her thought life brought her to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where she would take of the forbidden fruit and eat what God told her not to touch. If you want to become a better husband, listen to me church, I'm going to try to help you. If you want to be a better husband, if you want to be a better father, men, ladies, if you want to be a better wife or you want to be a better mother, or listen to me, all of us, if we want to be better Christians, we better learn how to guard our thoughts. Negative people think negative thoughts. People who's always down, they're always on the negative. You know why they're that way? Because they think on the negative. We have a generation that I've now been raised with and we've come up with a term like this. It's called victim mentality. No matter what you give them, how much you give them, they're still always the victim. Why? Because in their mind, they think that they are a victim. It all starts right there. Positive people think positive thoughts. Those people who can smile in the midst of a storm. They think on the good. I had a couple in my church, my best friend, he lost his little girl. Brother Joe was there preaching at our church when that little girl gave her life to Jesus Christ a year later on Christmas morning. They all woke up and she didn't. And I went and I preached that funeral of that little 11 year old girl. And I seen her mom and her daddy. They could have forsaken God. They could have blamed God. But they stood at that casket. And they shook every hand of every person that came by. And they there was standing in front of the casket of their 11 year old daughter. Praising the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may I suggest. Your attitude towards your pastor, towards your spouse, towards your kids, towards your grandkids, towards your church, all starts with your thoughts. Right here. The biggest battlefield that we will ever be on is only six and a half inches wide and it's between our two ears. 
You see, listen, Satan cannot have my soul. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. At 16 years old, I asked Jesus to come into my heart and to save me from my sins. And the Bible says he saved me to the uttermost. I've been secure in the hand of Almighty God and no man can pluck me out. So Jesus, listen, Jesus has my soul so Satan can't get it. And I'll suggest to you tonight, Satan don't care too much about my body. He knows that it's breaking down anyway. He knows it's just dirt and one day it's going to go into the ground so he can't have my soul and he don't want my body. Where is Satan coming to attack me in my mind? My thought life. What you think about, you bring about. Positive people think positive thoughts. Don't think this is uncommon or not scriptural because you can take your Bibles and you can flip over to the book of Philippians chapter number 4 and you can see what Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. Verse number 8, he said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. He says, listen, this is a man that was shipwrecked. This is a man that was in prison. This is a man that was ran out of cities. This is a man that was forsaken by all. And yet he said, you've got to dwell. You've got to think on the good things of God. Put on the helmet of salvation because the darts of the devil is coming at your mind. Coming at your mind. Real quick, let's focus on four things. The first thing I want to share with you is the length of your thoughts. The length of your thoughts. Good thoughts should linger. Bad thoughts should leave. The length of your thoughts. How long has that wicked thought been in your imagination? How long is that root of bitterness and that root of envy? How long is that root of jealousy? How long is that root of unforgiveness been in your mind? You cannot let it dwell there because it will choke you out. There was a man in the Bible named Ahipothel and he was one of the counselors of David and the Bible says when he spoke to King David it was as though it was the oracles of God that it was coming right out the mouth of God but one day David got in sin with the Hippothel's granddaughter Bathsheba and David did some wicked things instead of letting uh, instead of a Hippothel getting right for his unforgiveness he let that bitterness build in his mind build in his mind he let that unforgiveness and that bitterness build in his mind and one day he got his house together and he went hung himself your mind play tricks on you. The length of your thoughts. Billy Graham was talking to a man one day who had wasted his life. And Billy Graham was trying to help him. This is the story I read. And the man says, Billy, he says, it's all in my mind. It's all in my thoughts. I can't stop thinking about it. Billy said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. With God's help, you can. He said, so you're telling me I can stop every evil thought that comes into my head? Billy said, I, I didn't say that. Billy said, sir, let me tell you something. I can't stop a bird from flying over my head but I can stop that bird from building a nest in my hair. You may not be able to stop a thought from penetrating your, uh, 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 your mind. You may, may not be able to stop an evil image from penetrating your mind, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. Not only the length of your thoughts, but number two, the limitations of your thoughts. There should be some restrictions there should be some restrictions placed on your thought life. There should be some places my mind cannot go. I put restrictions on my cell phone. I put restrictions on my television. 
I put restrictions on, on who my daughter can date. I put restrictions on where my daughter can go. I've even put some restrictions inside of our church amongst our church people and how we conduct ourselves. I believe the Bible gives us some restrictions to protect us. We also need to take those restrictions and put them in our thought life. The length of your thoughts, the limitations of your thoughts, but also the lies in your thoughts. Your mind will lie to you. And Satan attacks your mind. And the Bible says in John chapter 8 verse 44 that he's the father of lies. He can't have my soul. It belongs to the Lord. He don't care too much about my body. So he's coming after my mind. We had a man in our community just three weeks ago was having chest pains. In his mid-50s, a great man in good shape. His wife told him, he said, she said, you need to go to the doctor. His kids told him, go to the doctor. But he kept telling himself, I'm fine, everything's okay. Even though his chest was hurting, even though his arm was hurting, he kept telling himself in his mind that everything was going to be okay. And three weeks ago, he was out on his tractor. He had a massive heart attack, and we buried him. Several years ago, I had a lady want to meet with me. I got Brother Jimmy Bird, who's been a faithful servant with my dad, now a faithful servant with me, to meet with this lady and, and myself. And she got in my office, and she'd been praying for her husband. Now, she's not a member of our church, but she'd been praying for her husband. He was a worldly, worldly man. And, and for 10 years, she'd been praying for her husband. Well, he finally got saved. He had ran around on her. He finally got saved. She comes in my office. She begins to tell Brother Jimmy Bird and myself. She says, now I'm in love with another man. And I'm thinking, you know, her husband's a new man. I'm like, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 She said, but it ain't my husband. And she said, Brother Caleb, this is her words. How I feel about this man, you can't tell me I'm wrong. And you can't tell me it's not of God. I've got peace about it. You can't tell me how I feel. I said, first of all, lady, you know, I can't tell you how you feel, but I can tell you this, it ain't right and it ain't of God. But in her mind, in her mind, she had already begun to think that God was okay with it. Our mind is where we justify our actions. Not only that, but the Lord of your thoughts. Not only the length of your thoughts, the limitations of your thoughts, the lies in your thoughts, but also the Lord of your thoughts. We say that our hearts, that our souls, that our future, that our lives, that our eternity belongs to Jesus. But have we given Him our mind? Have we given Him our thoughts? Who is the Lord of your thought life? 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 4 and 5 says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You say, Brother Caleb, I can get victory over that evil thought life. Absolutely. you got to bring those thoughts to the feet of Jesus when they penetrate your mind. One of the most powerful forces on the planet is the human mind. Thirty years ago, they told us that the man, a man or a woman, only used 10% of their mind capability. In this generation, they now say it's down to 4%. But listen... Everything on this planet that was not created by God was formed because of the human mind. Listen how powerful that is. I'll ride down through Atlanta, Georgia and see skyscrapers all the way that looks like they touched the sun. That started in the mind of a man. We put men on the moon because somebody thought about that. Today I can pick up my phone. I can FaceTime my brother in Christ in the Philippines and we can speak without any delay. That started in the mind of a man. You see, the mind is a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. I experienced firsthand what the mind can do to you. 
seven years ago, five years ago now, five or six years ago now, I began to, was going to preach at a church and I started having chest pains. I got really pale and I got clammy and, and before I preached I thought they was going to have to call a doctor or an ambulance but I got through it and I got home and my brother-in-law's a nurse and he checked me out and he said, you're fine. The next day it began to happen again. I went to the doctor and they said, sir, you're having a panic attack, an anxiety attack. I didn't know what that was. I thought I was dying. And for the next seven weeks, I got to where I couldn't swallow. I'm not joking. I ain't joking. Four nights, I went and stayed on the couch of my brother-in-law and my sister because I, was, I said if I begin to choke in my sleep, my, my brother-in-law could, could help me. I wouldn't eat. All I would eat was Wendy's chocolate frosty. Finally, I got enough courage just to get a cup of chili from Wendy's and I was so scared that it would get choked because I felt like I couldn't swallow that I went and sat in the parking lot of the ER at Bogalusa Medical Center and ate it. I went to five different doctors. I had my throat scoped by Dr. Crawford four different times. I had a tube ran down my esophagus, down all the way down just to check if there was any blockages. And every single doctor told me, Brother Caleb, you are perfectly fine. There is nothing wrong with you. They put me in the MRI machine. They checked everything and they said, you're perfectly fine. But in my mind, I thought I was dying. No matter what they told me. And I saw how powerful the mind is. May of 1954, something extraordinary happened right here in America. Something they said could never be done. For 2,000 years, people had been trying to break the four-minute mile. Nobody could do it. They could get close, but nobody could break the four-minute mile till one day a man from here in America named Roger Bannister ended up running a four-minute mile. 2,000 years they tried to do it. Nobody could do it. America celebrated. He became a hero. They built a statue of him. Only problem was this. 46 days later, John Landry broke his time on the four-minute mile. Nobody could do it for 2,000 years. One man does it. And 46 days later, a man beats his record. And now, athletes are running under the four-minute all the time. Why? Obviously it could be done, but people said it couldn't be done, so the mind kept people from doing it. As we've already heard, you bring about what you think about. Solomon says this. He says, whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you bring about what you think about, you better be careful. You better be careful with your mind. Be careful what you put in your mind. Be careful what you feed your mind. Oh, don't feed your mind immoral music, young people. Don't put those lyrics in your mind. Be careful of the images that you put into your mind. Be careful of the information that you put into your mind. Guard your mind with all diligence. For a while there, I was on this Fox News kick and Newsmax. I kept hearing it's the most important election. Man, it's been the most important election for 50 years now. And this guy Fetterman got elected. And I thought, oh man, we're through. It affected my spirit. It affected the way I lived. I was mad and I was depressed all the time. I didn't want to father my kids. I didn't want to be a husband to my wife. I didn't want to be a pastor of the church. I didn't want to be a preacher of the gospel because I said, we're all doomed. We're all doomed. But as soon as I cut that information off, guess what? <laughs> My life got better. Be careful what you put into your mind. Whatsoever man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible also tells us a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. For those who in their mind they want to serve God on Sunday and they want to live like hell on Friday and Saturday. Hey, listen, the Bible says something about that type of minded man. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Can't trust him. You have to be the gatekeeper of your thoughts, of your mind. You've got to keep trash out and you've got to keep good in. Judas had evil placed in his mind and in his heart by the devil. 
The devil is the great deceiver. Remember, he can't have my soul. And if you're saved, he can't have your soul. He don't care too much about my body, but he can come after my mind. The Bible says in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 10, the devil that deceived them. Satan puts deceptions and lies in our mind. The Bible says in John 8, 44, that he is the father of lies. Our great enemy, Satan, is out on this battlefield and he's coming after our mind. You say, Brother Caleb, this great enemy, Satan, he's coming after my mind. How in the world can I combat him? The same way Jesus did. The same way Jesus did. You say, Brother Caleb, how did Jesus combat the devil? He did it with truth. Hey, truth always wins. May I say truth always triumphs. Truth always trumps. And truth always tramples lies. Satan comes to our mind and he tries to fill it full of deception and full of lies. The only way that we can get victory over the devil who's coming to destroy our mind is we got to speak truth to the lies. How shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed unto the word of God? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Satan came to Jesus three times. He tempted him three times. Jesus had been in that wilderness 40 days and 40 nights fasting and one of the gospels records it like this. After that 40 days when Jesus was at his weakest, that's when Satan came. And he came speaking in the ear of Jesus to get into his mind. He says, you hungry? Well, who tells me I'm hungry? My mind does. You hungry? Take them stones and make it bread. You're God. Then he took Jesus up on a high pinnacle. He says, listen, you cast yourself down. The angels, God says, is in charge. I mean, he's, he's in charge of them. They'll catch you before you hit the ground. That's the second temptation. Then he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and said, I will give you these kingdoms if you will just bow to me. And all three times, all three times that Satan came after the mind of Jesus when he was at his weakest point, Jesus combated him with Scripture. Jesus combated the lies with the truth. The only way that you can get victory in your mind, the only way you can get deception away from your thoughts, you've got to speak truth to your mind. Truth always wins. Some of you in here tonight may be lost on a road to a devil's hell. And Satan's telling you, you're all right. He's lying. He's whispering in your thoughts, you're okay. You can wait till next Sunday. You can wait till church camp next year. You can wait till revival services. You don't get, I gotta get saved tonight. Jesus don't wanna save you. Look at you, you're a sinner. That's what Satan's speaking. He don't wanna save you. Look at you. If you came down and gave your life to Christ, you've been in this church 35 years. People would laugh at you and they would mock you. But the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the Bible says whosoever was not named, was not written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Listen to me if you're lost today. Don't let Satan lie to your mind anymore. Combat the lies with truth. You may be here tonight, and I'm closing. You're a Christian, but Satan's coming to your mind and saying, I saw what you did. I saw what you did. You want to get in there on Sunday, and you want to raise your hand. You want to get in that choir, and you want to sing. You want to smile at everybody, but you a sinner. I know it, and you know it. You a fake, and you a fraud. He wants to get you out of this church. 
He wants to get that smile off of your face. He wants to get you out of this choir. He wants to get you away from your preacher. How can I combat that? I know I'm a sinner. I fail every day. How can I combat the lies of the devil? You can only do it with truth. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, talking to believers, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who stands there and makes petitions on our behalf. Maybe you've been sick before and you didn't feel that nobody checked on you. This happens in our church. And the devil says, see, they don't care about you. See, they don't love you. Just get out the church and be by yourself. That'll make things ever that'll make it better. And then if you're not careful, Satan allow that thought to take up root and build bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment in your heart to the man of God and the church of God. If you'll just speak truth to your mind when Satan brings those lies, the Bible says, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Just speak truth to the lies. Some of you may be going through a dark time in your life, a storm in your life, a trial in your life. And Satan's in your ear saying, nobody cares about you. Nobody really loves you. You're all alone. You're all alone. That's what Satan's trying to tell you. Nobody cares about you. You see, he's the great deceiver. But then you take your Bible and you speak truth to those lies. Psalms 37, David said, I've been young and I'm now old. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Though we fall, we shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth us with his hand. The Bible tells us that God, that Jesus, is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If you're a born-again child of God, there's not a place that you can go on this planet where you are forsaken by an almighty God. You're not alone. Don't let Satan tell you that. Some of us soon may be departing this life. And if you're not careful, that's where Satan wants to attack you the most. You've lived for God and he wants you to go out on a sour note. And you may have to go through some hardships. You may have to endure what we all fear and that's the word cancer. And if you're not careful, Satan will come to you as a believer because he can't have your soul and he don't care about your body. He wants your mind and he will tell your mind that God has turned his back on you. If God really loved you, he wouldn't let you suffer like this. But you take the truth, the word of God. Even when you're about to cross over to the other side, you can say like David, Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You can take the scriptures and begin to quote it. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Listen to me, church. Jesus said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And with all thy mind. Where's your thought life at right now? Where's your thought life at? Your heart may be sealed by the Spirit of God. Your soul may be already resting in eternal places with God. But what about your mind? What about your mind? Are you letting Satan win the battle for your mind? Tonight, if you are, why don't you just come to this old-fashioned altar and say, Lord, forgive me for allowing Satan to just have free range, target practice on my thought life. I'm sorry, Lord. But tonight, tonight I'm taking the banner of truth and I'm speaking lie. I'm speaking truth to the lies. He's bringing in deception. I'm bringing in your word. And I'm going to speak truth to the lies. I'm not going to let, I didn't let Satan win with my soul. I gave my heart and my soul to you, and I'm not going to let him win with my mind. Why don't you just tonight make that commitment? As we stand together, every head bowed, every eye closed, dear Heavenly Father, we come before your presence tonight. God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you, God, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. 
God, I pray you would take this feeble mind of mine. And God, this weak sermon, God, you would use it for your honor and your glory. God, I know in my life I've let Satan win in the battle of my mind many times. Lord, I'm so sorry. God, you've given us truth to speak to the lies. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. They're going to play a verse of this.